Hey there, welcome to Grand Point Church. Our mission is to help as many people as possible take their next steps to find and follow Jesus. Thanks for tuning into the message. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but the game of chess uh, originated in India, uh, but quickly spread throughout Asia, spread throughout Europe, and became quite popular among the royalty. In fact, they played this game uh, because it was, it was kind of the monarch's way of symbolizing uh, power and intellect and noble pursuits. Uh, so the game of chess became very popular with, no, uh, with royalty. Now, in our country, we do not function under the model of a monarchy uh, where we refer to our leaders as kings and queens. Our model is a democracy uh, wherein our leaders are elected. And I think you would agree with me, there is absolutely nothing that foments division within a society like an election. It happens every time, and it has happened historically. We are now less than nine weeks away from a rather interesting election, and the emotions are running hot. I know that, because you told me. You left me know that. And I know that um, some of the, just the mention of this series has evoked some emotions with some of you. Uh, and and I, it's okay, but I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to identify those emotions, and I want you to name them. Because if you identify them and name them, we might be able to see where they're coming from, and maybe you can even check them and, and work through some of those. For example, for some of you, it might be anxiety. Right, You have all these emotions of anxiety. You're just really fearful about what's going to happen in this election. And maybe the years coming after that, you're fearful for your business. You're fearful for your retirement. You're fearful. Maybe it's anger. I know this. For some of you, anger is just underneath the surface. And it doesn't take much for, for it to trigger. All someone has to do is mention something negative about your candidate and look out. Right? The anger is going to come out there. Maybe you're a little bit apathetic. Right, You don't know who to believe or what to believe, and it's just this constant rhetoric, and you're like, you know what, I just can't wait till it's over. I just can't wait till it's over. Now, you might even add a few more emotional uh, responses to that, and I would say that's okay. Uh, it's understandable, perhaps even justifiable, because we do find ourselves in a really complicated, divisive political climate where perhaps it doesn't feel like anyone can win or worse yet, we're all set up to lose. Well, regardless of the results in November, uh, there's going to be about half of our country who feel as if the world is coming to an end, right? Even right now, if you're being honest, some of you are really, really nervous about what I'm going to say tonight. You're not quite sure what I'm going to say. You're not sure where this is going. In fact, you've been inviting this friend to church for months and months and months. And today, they finally came. You haven't had the nerve to look over at them for the last two minutes because you're like, you're like I'm sorry, I didn't know he was going to do this. And you're like, PL, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Because, you know, some of you are so exhausted right now about all this stuff. You just want to come to church. You want a safe place. You want a place where we're not dealing about with, and now you're like, oh, no, not here, too, right? So here we go. Some of you are wrapped up, and you're passionate about this topic, and you're ready for your pastor to wave the banner, as long as it's the right one. So what I want to do, I just want everyone collectively just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Primarily, what I want to do tonight and through this whole series is to make you, is to help you make all the right moves against our real opponent and capture the heart of the King of Kings. I believe political questions are important, but they can be, and they are divisive. You know, the church is not supposed to be a place where everyone sees every issue the same. That's called a cult. The church is supposed to be a place where even societal adversaries can find common unity in Christ. And I believe we can do that. Political questions are important, but the gospel that unites us is even more important. The bonds in the body of Christ should be stronger than our political affiliation, and the flag that we march behind should compel greater allegiance 
than the banner of any political party. As J.D. Greer says, we're not the party of the donkey or we're not the party of the elephant. We're the people of the lamb. So let me begin by addressing some expectations. I know some of you have them because since I've announced this series, I've gotten your letters, I've gotten your book recommendations, I've gotten your handouts, I've gotten your references to podcasts, I've gotten your emails that all suggest in different ways your expectations. And to be honest with you, I'll just put this right out there. I know I'm going to disappoint some of you. I know some of you are going to think that I'm not taking a stand on any particular issue. I know that some of you want me to name sins and you want me to name names behind those sins. And I get that. You can find preachers all over the internet doing that. And what I want to do is share with you something that I believe is on the heart of Christ and on my heart as well. I too watch the news. I read the podcast. I read the books. I read the Bible and I can't think, I can't think of a more bold stand to take. I can't think of a more positive message to give. And I can't think of more effective action to take than what Jesus says we are to be doing in our identity as salt of the earth and light of the world. So my expectations through this series beginning tonight are to help you rise above the low-lying issues of this world and awaken you to the high calling of citizenship in another kingdom. That is not to say that we're not to be responsible stewards of our citizenship here. That's not to say that you don't vote. It's not to say that we bury our heads in the sand. But it simply means that we need to know our identity and where we stand in all of this. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but Jesus gives us some amazing moves to make in order to be the influence that this world so desperately needs. So that's my heart. That's my motivation. Now, let me give you a couple of guiding questions to sort of direct our time this, this evening. And, and I'm speaking primarily, I know, to followers of Jesus Christ. But if you're here tonight and you are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, first of all, welcome. Welcome into, into the house here. But I know that you're also looking for answers because you're like, man, this is a dumpster fire of division. Right? And it doesn't have to be. And you're wondering, is there a better way to handle this? Is there a better way to go into an election season without all of this division and this rhetoric and this name calling? And I can assure you there is. There is. So here are a few questions that maybe will frame our talk tonight. And that is this. As followers of Jesus, how should we think about, participate in, and respond to the incredibly divisive political climate that we find ourselves in? And maybe another question to ask is, how can we live lives of allegiance to Jesus in a society governed by people who have a different perspective and have different priorities? Now, thankfully, we're not the first group of people facing these questions. History shows us that this has been a source of div there's been a source of division and debates uh, for centuries as it relates to elections. You might even think tonight that we are facing the worst political crisis ever, and so that when the Bible was written, it had no idea how to address the problems that we're facing today. I'm sure, and maybe you're thinking that, of course. In Jesus' day, things were much more simple. Things were much more aligned, and everybody agreed on politics more than we do today. That would be a nice thought if it were true, but it's not. In fact, I would even argue that things were just as divided and heated during Jesus' day politically, if not more so, because they didn't have just two primary political perspectives. They had at least six. So you think two are bad. How about six? Let me just very quickly uh, tell you what they are. And I'm just going to highlight a few, and I'm going to try to do it in this way that, that will help you understand perhaps what Jesus was stepping into when he gave us the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, you, we, we, we've got what we might call Henry the Herodian and Peter the Galilean. Now, these two guys didn't see eye to eye on anything at all. They were at each other. They were disagreeing with each other, and they lived on the same street, but they just couldn't get along. Henry the Herodian and Peter the Galilean. Peter believed that all God's people lived in Galilee, therefore Galilee should, occup should be occupied by the Galileans. And he was really miffed because Rome was now beginning to occupy Galilean territory, and he saw that as a threat. 
So Peter's over here. Peter's over here. And he, like, he wants to make Galilee great again. Now, now, Henry over here, he had a totally different perspective. He's thinking, you know what? Actually, Israel's best chances of survival would be under the reign of King Herod. And so these two guys, they just saw things totally different from totally different perspectives. They did not get along. That was in Jesus' day. The second group of people that Jesus dealt with was Saul the Pharisee and Josephus the Sadducee. Now, these two guys were kind of the cultural elites. They were kind of at the top of, of, of the ladder when it came to, came to culture. But these guys had dramatically different political opinions. One of them wanted to watch CNN. The other one wanted to watch Fox News, right? One of them would have listened to Meg, Megyn Kelly. The other one would have listened to Rachel Maddow. They had totally different ideas. But Saul over here, the Pharisee, he really believed in the written law of God, but he also believed in the inspiration of the oral law of God. And Josephus over here thought Saul was a liberal, and they're back and forth at each other. He was like, there's no oral law of God. How could you have that perspective? And they just didn't get along. Next, we have Matthew the publican and Simon the zealot. Now, these two guys may have most closely, rep might, might most closely represent the political divisions that we experience today. They saw things totally, totally different, uh, very differently. The zealots believed in something called a theocracy. They didn't believe that there should be any human earthly elected leader. We should just all be under the reign of God. And Matthew was a believer in God. He was a follower of God. And he worked for the government. He was considered a traitor because he collected taxes from his people for the government. So these two guys were at odds with each other. But here's an interesting fact about these two. Jesus invited both Simon and Matthew to be two of the 12 disciples, even though they were on opposite aisles of the political landscape. Jesus brought them together. Now, now you can just imagine the heated debates that these two guys would have with Jesus as they're sitting around the campfire at night. I mean, they probably would have been going at it. And Matthew might have said something like this, Simon, listen, I, I just don't get it, man. We've always had people overseeing us as God's people. First, we were in Egyptian captivity. Then we were in Babylonian captivity. Then we were in Persian captivity. And, and, and we're okay. Like, like we're, we're doing this. We can still be Christians under this oppressive authority uh, so he's like we're just we can just be opportunistic not just patriotic and Simon would be over here looking back at Matthew and says Matthew like you're an idiot right how can you think that way how can you live that way how can you vote that way and call yourself a follower of Jesus sound familiar man the political landscape that Jesus stepped into it was just as complex and divided as it is today. So you, don't, you want to know where Jesus landed on this? You want to know, so you want to know what the verses are that, that tell you who Jesus advocates for? Well, I just want to look at a, a few of those. Um, so I want you to see where Jesus stands and which political party he aligns with. So here's just a few. Um, actually, there are none. There are no verses. There are no verses where Jesus advocates for any one of these six political parties. In fact, in the longest sermon that he gave, that he ever preached, called the Sermon on the Mount, he would have had every opportunity to speak to this. But he never once brings up the subject of politics. But what Jesus does do in the Sermon on the Mount is shifts our thinking from a political ideology to a priority of relationship. Now, I want you to catch this because this is so important for all of us right now in this season that we're entering into. He refrains from a commentary on policies and teaches specifically on relational practices. Instead of supporting the policies of one side or another, he offers a list of practices that can be performed by anyone. Several months ago, we began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes here, Took a little break over the summer. But, but Jesus says something there. He says, here's a sampling of the practices that, that Jesus commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, show mercy. 
show mercy, make peace, refrain from angrily mocking your opponent, prioritize relationships over winning disputes, avoid sexual scandals, tell the truth. It's all right here in Matthew. And we're going to be working through some of those over the next couple of weeks, but this is what Jesus says is important. Show mercy, make peace. Don't call each other names. Stop mocking, ang- stop mocking your opponent. Prioritize relationships. Avoid sexual scandals and tell the truth. Now, now you're like, wait a minute. The Sermon on the Mount, that wasn't to political leaders. Was it? Wasn't that to disciples of Jesus? Yes, it was. It says Jesus went up into the mountain and his disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them, saying, but large groups of people gathered around. But here's the thing. If this was important to Jesus and Jesus wanted this to be so important to his disciples, it needs to be important for us. This needs to be our mantra. This is what, this is what we, 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 we ought to do. It amazes me how so many American Political Christians overlook this list and don't even think there's anything wrong with it. But where does that leave us? What, what is, what, why did Jesus do this and, and where do we come in on this? I'm glad you asked because the very next verse uh, on the Sermon on the Mount s- tells us. So Jesus gives all of these beatitudes and says, this is what your attitudes ought to be like. Right in the mid- Remember, this is in the midst of a political culture, a very divided culture. You have to read your Bible to know that, but it is. This is, this is he's facing a political division. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Right In light of all of these things that are happening, verse 13, he looks at his disciples and he says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He looks them right in the eyes again and he says, not only are you the salt of the earth, but you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket on a stand and it gives light to all that are in the house. In the same way, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Who's Jesus speaking to? Disciples, not politicians. He's speaking to his disciples. So what is the role of a Christ follower? Number one, you're the salt of the earth. Number two, you are the light of the world. That's what's going to make a difference. It's not who we put in office. Of course, that that makes somewhat of a difference. But it doesn't transform the world. It doesn't make this world the success that, 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 that we can make as, as Christians. And I want you to know that Jesus never, never minimized the role of his followers. He never told us as his followers just to have some modest aspirations. He never, never reminded them that they're only human. He never limited our potential as spirit-filled, divinely equipped beings, never suggested that we retreat from this world. No, he called his followers to be salt and light, agents of seasoning, preservation, growth, and brilliance, not just to tell a story to the world, but to help the world flourish. That's us. That's our role. That's our privilege. Now, in the ancient world, salt was highly valued as a seasoning agent. And now this is not a commercial here tonight, but I can't even imagine life without tastefully simple seasoned salt. I'm serious. I, I would have brought a bottle in to show you, but we ran out of it. It is a bad day. It's a bad day. Tastefully seasoned, seasoned tastefully simple seasoned salt brings the flavor out of steak like nothing else. Chris, it makes vegetables taste good, especially green ones. Makes you come back for seconds. It does everything to bring the flavor and and seasons everything to perfection. Can't imagine, can't imagine life without seasoned salt. I don't know if you knew this, but in the oldest book of the Bible, Job, Job says this, he actually asked the question, he says, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? The answer is, No, 
No, we need salt to bring out the flavor. So when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, he meant that his followers, by nature, by nature, would bring a flavor to life. They'd bring a zest to living. They'd be the seasoned agents that make life palatable. That's who you are. Jesus does not say you should be salt of the earth or you are, could be the salt of the earth. He's not even saying that you're growing into being the salt of the earth. He says you are the salt of the earth. You are. Not might be. Not could be. But that's what you are. Salt was also a symbol of purity. Now perhaps what Jesus had in mind was purity of motives resulting in telling the truth. In a culture that has perfected and accepted the art of lying, as Christ's followers, we ought to be known for our honesty. Perhaps Jesus also meant sexual and moral purity because the absence of that is what destroys lives, it's what destroys homes, and it's what destroys nations. Salt also creates thirst. Even today, Arabs will take salt to force them to drink liquids in order to avoid the dehydration caused by the desert. So they take salt, and salt forces them to drink even before they sense the need. Now, if that's the case, what Jesus is saying is that we are of worth because we cause people to thirst after God. Farmers and fishermen who heard Jesus speak these words, they would have thought of the way that they most use salt to preserve fish and other meat. So God has put us on this earth to be agents of preservation. Let me ask you a question. I want you to ask this of you personally. Are you bringing, are you bringing flavor to the lives of people who are in your sphere of influence? Are you committed to honesty and purity? Is your life causing others to thirst for God? Are you living as an agent of preservation? If you can't answer yes to that, you're, you're part of the problem. It's not a political problem. It's a, it's a church problem. If, if we're not being who we're called to be or who Jesus says we are, we're missing it. We're missing it. This world desperately needs salt, needs the salt of the earth. That's our greatest need. Our greatest need is not someone new in the White House. It's not some new political administration. I mean, you can have your opinions on that, but the greatest need in this world is Christians who are seasoning this world, causing people to thirst for Christ and bringing them to Christ. That's what will transform our nation. Jesus also says you're the light of the world. A couple things about light. It can't be hidden. There is no such thing as a secret service Christian. Light is also the second thing about light is this. It is most dramatically displayed in dark places. That is exactly why God permits dark places in our lives. While so many people lament the hardships they're facing and the difficult circumstances they're going through and having to endure, you can rest in the knowledge that God is, is positioning you purposefully. He's allowing you to get through those dark places. You don't have to wonder why he is not blessing you with the things that people define as blessings. If you are going to live a supernatural lifestyle, it will have to be in those places where the light of God is already, is not already on display. He's going to take you into those places of darkness. Miracles happen best in places of lack and places of need. So God will allow you to go through dark places for two reasons. Number one is so you can learn who he is and strengthen your faith in him. And number two, so that you can actually be positioned for greater influence. So we lament the darkness. Oh, the world's becoming a dark place. Everything's so dark and the sin is... It's so you can shine brighter. It's so you can shine brighter. The darker the place, the, the, the brighter the light shines. Now, I don't want persecution. I don't like persecution any more than you do. Newsflash. Countries where Christians are being persecuted is where the church is actually doing the best. It's where the light is shining the brightest. 
It's where people are coming to know Christ. If this world becomes darker, do not fret. It's not going to ruin the, the church is going to be last forever. God has positioned his church to be here forever. The, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It just becomes a brighter light as the world becomes darker. The hope of the world is the church, not the election. We okay so far? We can talk afterwards. I'm sure we will. Remember Joseph? Joseph was sent away from his hometown, his own family. He was taken down into Egypt. Daniel and his friends were sent into Babylon in the most traumatic of circumstances because God wanted to send light into those places. They went into some places that were not Christian at all, but that's where they shone brighter. You're the light of the world. You are the light of the world. We don't expect our politicians to be that, to do that. That's not who they are. You are the light of the world. So wherever you are, your calling is to reflect him, to glow with his brilliance, and to display his nature even where darkness has reigned. Don't miss your opportunity to be light. Now, let me just ask you a question. We'll wrap it up with this. How can we be the salt and light? Number one is uh, engage the culture. Salt is no good in a salt shaker. Light is no good under a basket. You and I are to take Christ to society because they're not going to come to us. We can't expect the unbelievers to come to us. We're to go to them. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus calls his first disciples and he says, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. They had been fishermen, now they're going to fish for men. Why that analogy? Because fishermen know that they have to go to where the fish are. You can't sit back and wait for the fish to jump into your boat. You have to go where they are. Fishermen always use bait, also use bait that attracts the fish not just the bait that's convenient to them. See, not many of us would choose to dig these worms out of the earth and then impale them on hooks, right? That's not what we want to do, but fishermen use the bait that the fish will bite. Fishermen also know that you fish when the fish are active, not, when they, not just when the fisherman wants to fish. No, you wait for that moment when the fish are active, and they measure success not by the size of their boat, but by the size of their catch. Now, these factors all pertain to cultural transformation. Since people are not coming to us, we need to go to them. That's what I loved about today. Today was awesome. We, we didn't meet here. No, we went to the community, 18 different places in the community. 340-some members, servants of Grand Point Church, went to the community to make a difference. That's what we do. We go to where the people are. We go to your office. We go to the classroom. We go to the neighborhood. We go to all those places. That is your kingdom assignment. Know that you're a missionary to your culture wherever you are. See, we bloom where we're planted. Ask God to lead you where he's at work to follow his spirit because he's drawing people to Jesus. He just needs us to be that middle person to lead them to Christ. I want you to know that God is working in the hearts of people all around us. He is. I firmly believe that. And he's ready to call you into your role of ministry to be that person that just has the conversation that leads them to Christ. Now, you know eternal salvation is not up to you. You cannot convict a single sinner of a single sin. You can't save a single soul. But the Spirit of God wants to use your witness and your compassion as he leads people to the Lord. Go where he leads. It's our mission. Engage the culture. Number two, influence those that you know. Don't just think about the what ifs, but think about the who, who ours. Right? Salt and light are measured by taste and the visibility that they bring to places where they touch. 
The salt shaker is not as important as the salt that's in it. The candlestick is not as important as the candle's light. See, we got, let's go back to Jesus' analogy of, of fishing for men. The boat is not as important as the fish. Our culture measures success by what it can see. It's our popularity. It's our possessions. It's our performance. But God measures us by what he can see. God measures success by what he can see, and that's changed lives and saved souls. Number three is lose yourself to gain the kingdom. How can we be salt and light, engage the culture, Influences, influence those that you know, and lose yourself to gain the kingdom. See, the salt always disappears when it works. The light is dissipated as it overcomes the dark. It's not about you. God is the great I am. We are the little I am nots. Mother Teresa called herself a tiny pencil in the hand of God. I love that imagery. Be that pencil and know that God can make more of your life than you can. You cannot measure the eternal significance of your present faithfulness, but God will take your present faithfulness and he will do, do something significant with that. So we wrap this up here as the band comes up to lead us. I want you to know this. Our identity of being salt and light is a high, high calling. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's your identity. But I want you to see in this text that it comes with warnings. Jesus suggests that the, the, the possibility of salt losing its potency and light being hindered and, red and, and, and rendered ineffective. It's possible. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, but it's possible to become ineffective. Salt is meant to be salty. Light is meant to shine. Not so that they can be glorified, but that the world, but, but because the world so desperately needs what they offer. The world needs you as the salt of the earth. The world needs you as the light of the world. Every single believer in Jesus Christ is designed and gifted and called to meet needs. We're the ones that make the difference. We are meant to be present. We're meant to be active without being ostentatious, effective without being overbearing, and influential without seeking power. That means that in some measure or another, you are on display. You're on display. As someone who claims the name of Jesus, you are called to season the world with your salt. You are called to shine the light with your light. You may not want a prominent role someplace in God's kingdom. You may not, you may not even desire the responsibility of bearing his name for fear that you won't live up to it. But his name is given to you anyway, for better or for worse. You will shape his reputation in the eyes of our culture. You will do that for better or for worse. Jesus' words to his disciples unapologetically commissioned them as agents of his kingdom. They signal a high calling for all of his followers then and now to be exactly what this world needs. And can I just say it's a simple kingdom? It's a simple kingdom. Jesus didn't make this complicated. Our kingdoms are more complicated than the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God simply says to all the followers of Jesus, it's why you're here. It's why you're here. When Jesus is done with you, he's going to take you out of here. But while you're here, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. How effective are we? Are we making a difference? Are we making a difference at all? Are we looking to someone else to be the savior of the world? Are we looking at this election to make the change? That's our responsibility. It's not to say that you don't become involved. It's not to say that you don't vote. It's not to say that you don't do your homework and vote for the right candidate. Not, not at all. But remember, you have a high calling. It is not our political office. We're not here to save America. We're, here to, we're not here to save America. We're here to save Americans. Right? Our, 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 our high calling is to, to, to sh shape this world through individual transformation. And God has called us to do that. Let that be the beginning of a challenge for this season. And next week, we're going to pick up as we, as we pick up in Matthew and just follow Jesus all the way through this sermon because he deals with some pretty big issues. 
We're going to be talking about a lot of big things. Read ahead. But just remember in the meantime, you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And that makes a difference in how we act. It's make, it makes a difference in how we have conversations. I had an email this week. I told you they would come. I had an email this week, hours after I announced this series last Sunday. And this email said, it said blatantly, I do not understand. It said it is absolutely impossible for you to be a Christian and vote for, and they made a name. And then they said, I've lost family members. I can't, I can't have conversations with family members and with friends anymore because of politics. That is just wrong. Just wrong. If politics is driving you and dividing you from family and friends, you've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. Seasoning, preservation, creating thirst does not drive people away. Brings them closer. Brings them in. That's what we're called to be. Watch that all throughout this season and be the salt, be the light that you are. God, thank you again for and just being so clear with your words in the very midst of a political climate that you were in. I thank you for kind of setting up your kingdom, a very simple kingdom that just defined what, what the influences are that transform culture, that transform society, that change nations. It's when your people are salt and light, making a difference in the world around us. God, help us to be those people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the week's message. We'd love to connect with you on social media, so give us a follow and be sure to check out our website, grandpoint.church slash next steps.